Hello, everyone. Welcome to Groundwater Talk Live. I'm Tom Ballard, the Groundwater Guy, and our topic today is the problem with salt. And I wanted to uh, mention that um, <clears throat> this, this is a, becoming a bigger issue. I ran across a scientific paper, a publication, and some other documentation that I thought I'd uh, cover this topic. We haven't really talked about it much here, so <clears throat> so that's, that's going to be our topic today. Um, but before we get going, I would ask you if you like this content on the on the channel, uh, please like, comment, and share. I answer all the comments, and we appreciate any likes and shares. It helps get the word out there, and and uh, and uh, helps us beat the algorithm, I guess, and, and get the word out there so more people can can see the show. So uh, thank you very much for for people that comment. I appreciate all the comments, and, and I answer them all. So thank you very much. All right, so today we're talking about the problem with salt and particularly the anthropogenic salt cycle. So anthropogenic obviously means man-made, so this is opposed to the salt cycle that, that's uh, uh, more naturally occurring. We, we do see some, some uh, salts coming in into uh, water, surface water, and groundwater from natural processes, but um, the problem is, is man's activities have really accelerated that cycle and causing more salinity in both groundwater and surface water drinking water sources. So so this is something that, uh, that, that we want to look at and explore a little bit today. And just as a point of clarity, when I talk about salt, I am, I'm talking about uh, not just uh, sodium chloride table salt uh, type of salt, uh, but we're talking about anion cation combinations that produce, uh, you can have potassium chloride, uh, calcium chloride, uh, besides uh, sodium chloride, which is your normal salt, and any other combination of, uh, of uh, cations and anions is actually what's termed as salt. So, and a lot of times these are measured as total dissolved solids, so we can actually look at the content of, of water and, and all gets lumped into total dissolved solids or TDS for short, if, if you're in the business. So, so anyway, what I did is I came across a paper here uh, that, that uh, talks about this a little bit and is probably the most recent paper, and, and that's not it. Uh, we're going to look at that one in just a minute, but uh, this uh, actually was published in Nature Reviews, which I don't have a, a subscription to and, and was not able to get access to that. But but they published the, the uh, uh, I looked at some summaries and they did publish the a abstract here, which I think is, is really what we want to look at. And so <clears throat> what they're saying here, and, and this puts it very succinctly, is increasing salt production and use is shifting the natural balances of salt ions. And once again, we're not just talking about sodium chloride, common salt. We're talking about salts in general or total dissolved solids, if you will, um, across earth systems causing interrelated effects across biophysical si systems collectively known as freshwater salinization syndrome. So, so what's happening is our freshwater resources by the acceleration of, of salt being introduced into these resources, these freshwater resources, they're becoming increasingly salty and less able to be used uh, for, for drinking water purposes. And even agricultural purposes, you get a lot of salinity in your, your water supply for different crops. And, and there are many crops that are very sensitive to the salinity of, of the, the water that's being used to water them. So, so this, this can be an issue, uh, both, both for our drinking water sources for people and for, for agricultural uses. So, uh, so basically what they've done here, they conceptualize the natural salt cycle and synthesize increasingly global trends of salt production and river salt concentrations and, and fluxes. So fluxes just means the, the mass that's going into those particular uh, uh, receptacles, if, if you will. So, so they differentiate here between the natural salt cycle and the anthropogenic cycle. So the natural salt cycle is primarily driven by relatively slow geologic and hydrologic processes that bring different salts to the surface of the earth. Anthropogenic activities have accelerated the processes, time scales, and magnitudes of salt fluxes and altered their directionality. 
<clears throat> which means you know their their uh, transference to to our drinking water sources, <clears throat> creating an anthropogenic salt cycle. So they talk about the global salt production has increased rapidly over the past century for different salts, with approximately 300 million tons of sodium chloride, which is our our common salt that we think of produced per year. Um, a salt budget for, for the USA suggests that salt fluxes in rivers can be within similar orders of magnitude as anthropogenic salt fluxes, and there can be substantial accumulation of salt in watersheds. They don't talk too much in this paper about groundwater, but, but it is a big issue. We'll touch on this in, in, in our, our show here as, as we go along here. But, but um, freshwater salinization syndrome is, is something that affects our, our food sources, like I mentioned, uh, energy, energy production, and they even get into air quality, human health, and, and infrastructure. Human health is, is a big deal. Um, too much salt won't directly kill you necessarily, but it does cause cause some other issues that we'll talk about. So, so uh, and they talk about at the end there. There's a need to identify environmental limits and threshold for salt ions and and uh, plans to reduce salinization. So, so this this is an important thing here. So, so this article actually led to um, uh, this this. Uh, uh, this uh, post in in the Washington Post, uh, this article in the Washington Post. So, so they kind of took this article and expanded on it here. <laughs> and so they're they're uh, we have to have a dra dramatic headline, of course. So, um, but um, you know the point is here: the Earth is getting saltier, um, not because they're they're uh, making more salt necessarily, but because. What's happening is we're processing salt, we're getting it into a form, and it's going into our, our water sources. We're, the anthropogenic salt cycle really is the process of, of taking natural salts that are in the environment that we mine and, and we use and putting them in a, in a, in a system that's basically reaching our, our water sources and making them increasingly saltier. So, so that's, that's really what, what's happening here. Um, uh, and this article goes on to talk about, you know, how human activities, uh, which is the anthropogenic part of the, of the cycle here, uh, um, is really making things saltier, and that's going to ultimately affect our water resources, which is our focus here. So, um, <clears throat> so they got a couple cases here. Saltier water led to brown tap water for months in Montgomery, Maryland. It played a part in creating the, the toxic lead-laden water in Flint, Michigan, and there's a whole story on that, is the increased salinity of the water actually stripped the protection, the chemical protection that was in the pipes when they moved to a new water source, and it actually stripped the protection out, which then exposed the lead and, and increased lead, lead values in, in the water. So, so yeah, it can have an effect. There's There's been case histories in New York and Baltimore. Baltimore, particularly where where we've seen increased saltiness and and where to the point where people are actually noticing the increased saltiness based on the on the taste of the water. So, so this does impact our our water resources. So, yeah, they go on to say here that salt pollution isn't some flashy threat to to our our existence, but it can be an excess existential crisis because it does affect our drinking water sources and we can our body can't we can't drink salt water and and satisfy our thirst and, and because it it uh, it creates some some particular health issues and we're not going to dive into that too much but but uh, we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit later but but you can't drink salt water and and survive so um so it's uh <laughs> and and we have the, the lead of the study that we just looked at here said it might be the most boring but contemporary problem we have. So, so yeah, most people don't think of your table salt as, as an issue, but, but, but it is when it's going into our drinking water sources and making them saltier. So, 
So they go on and talk a little bit about over the last 50 years, salt ions have increased in streams and rivers. And like I say, their focus is more on surface water, not on groundwater. But really, you can take everything here and apply it to groundwater as well. So um, say about 2.5 billion acres of soil, an area about the size of the United States, has become saltier. So huge land mass uh, and, and the soil. And anything that's in the soil, of course, is going to leach off into our surface water and also uh, percolate into, into our groundwater as well. So, uh, and also salt lakes are also drying up and sending saline dust into the air, so an air quality issue. Um, and that can indirectly impact our water resources as well. So, um, it, so let's go down here and, and they talk about an excess, uh, an existential threat, problems with that word, but, um, uh, and, you know, they talk about salt and, uh, natural and necessary component of earth. It's, uh, we use it in a lot of different things and we'll talk a little bit about the major sources here, but they've talked about how human activities have really accelerated, uh, the movement of, of salt into our, our water sources here. So agriculture, mining, construction, water, road treatment, and additional industrial activities are increasing the salt in our ground groundwater and freshwater systems uh, and, and the air too. So um, <clears throat> they talk about uh, irrigation around salty lakes. We'll dive into the agriculture a little bit too. Um, and they talk about the major source is is road salt. And, you know, the, the thing is, is we really like our our uh, our roads clear in the winter. And and so we salt the roads that melts the ice and keeps us from slip sliding down our roads in the winter and, and makes things safer. But that salt has to go somewhere when when it when the water melts, when the ice melts, it takes the salt with us. It flows off to uh, to our, our surface water. It gets in our groundwater and we increase the salt concentration. So. So road salt uh, can can uh, um, can can be a significant issue, and as they point out here, road salt made up forty four percent of the country's entire salt consumption. <clears throat> so that that's a lot, actually. So um, road salt can contaminate freshwater streams, as I mentioned, um, <clears throat> and so that's that's the influx. Uh, of salt is is that's going to be a majority. I'll show you some other sources here that, that we're getting to. Um, um, <coughs> excuse me. So um, there is, uh, you know, there's some solutions out there, and we'll talk a little bit about that too. But but I wanted to point out this one. They say in recent years, some areas, including Washington, have switched out road salt for a more unusual sounding antidote, beet juice. A beet juice brine, which contains less salt, although it still contains some salts, uh, helps lower the freezing point of ice, sticks to roads more effectively, and is better for the environment. So that's a lot of beets, but um, and the way the way salt works to lower uh, to lower uh, it it, it to to, uh, to melt ice is basically. Anytime you add an impurity, it changes the freezing point of anything. So, so water obviously freezes into ice. If you add an impurity like salt that, that, that melts, gets it, it, salt is very easy to, it, it, it gets into the water and it, and it creates an impurity in the water. And that then lowers the freezing point, which causes it to melt. And that's the effect we get. So, but adding any other impurity, like the beet juice here, also has the same effect because you're adding an impurity and it's taking the, uh, all chemicals like water have a freezing point that's established and water is 32 degrees. That's the freezing point. So you do, but adding an impurity actually changes the chemical properties enough that you lower the freezing point significantly enough that, that now we get down to, to the point where where you've lowered it enough where where it's going to melt even when when normal water would freeze so so that is that's basically how the the road salt process works um so this is one way of looking at things um and you know they're saying we're salting the earth where it shouldn't be salted 
a lot of salt out there. And this is not, not something, it, it's, it's like they said earlier, this is a boring problem, but it is a problem nevertheless, and it is impacting our, our water supply. So so that's, that is that. Let's uh, go back to our, our the, and dive into a little bit more to our presentation. So really, you know, to kind of recap a little bit, the anthropogenic salt cycle refers to the human-induced acceleration of the natural salt cycle, which was primarily driven by slow geologic and hydrologic processes that bring different salts to the Earth's per, uh, surface. And it's kind of a natural process, and we've accommodated things, and and things don't get, get much more salty. The man's activities that have really accelerated that cycle and now our water sources are getting saltier from the anthropogenic salt cycle. We've accelerated that natural process is really what it comes down to and we've accelerated it substantially. So salt ions have increased in rivers and streams over the last 50 years, uh, which is consistent with global patterns in salt production and consumption. So one-to-one -one correlation, and the salting roads thing is, is a big part of that. So um, this increase in salt concentration can pose an existential threat to our freshwater supplies, as I said in the, uh, in the study we, we, we just showed earlier. So... Uh, and groundwater, <clears throat> of course, uh, increases in salinity due to anthropogenic activities such as agriculture and road salting are accelerating. We are seeing groundwater basins becoming saltier uh, and as we measure them. And this, this is bad for agriculture, it's bad for our drinking water sources. For instance, 500 parts per million total dissolved solids, or TDS, which is basically how we measure salt concentrations is, is TDS. That's considered to be the upper limit for drinking water quality. So you start to approach that and you're starting to get a little brackish in your water. You can taste that. The water doesn't taste as good. It, it kind of, I call it chewy water. So, so probably not as good. So that's kind of what we're looking at. Generally, most drinking water is going to be, you know, in the 100 to 200 parts per million range for, for TDS. And that's, that, that's, that's enough to, to provide some consistency the water we don't we won't we don't want to have zero in there because then then you get distilled water taste and, and that's kind of boring so so a little bit of total dissolved solids uh, gives some character to our water and makes it makes it unique uh, but but uh, too much then starts creating creating problems for us so um, health impacts of high salts in water include increased hypertension, uh, increased risk of cardiovascular disease, and, and those two actually go together, uh, increased infant mortality, and obviously too much salt in, in, your, your, uh, in your digestive system, like if you're out in, in, in the ocean and, and uh, drinking salt water, will cause fresh water to actually um, leave your body and go to that salt to try to dilute it. That's your natural uh, protection mechanism in your body and you can actually dehydrate yourself by by drinking uh, um, too much uh, uh, too much salt water now now we can we can strike a little bit of balance it used to be that that uh, athletes took salt tablets to to increase their hydration but we really don't do that much much anymore so and the other thing is is high salts can increase the leaching of metals into water sources uh, creating additional negative health effects and things like we saw in Michigan where the salts actually created a chemical change that str stripped the protective coatings off those pipes and exposed lead-based pipe and then the salt in the water then tended to mobilize that lead and you had an increase in lead concentrations to unhealthy levels. So something that was totally unanticipated when they did that. They probably should have anticipated it and, and paid attention to it. And I can tell you folks are paying attention to that these days, but it was something that they did not intend to, to happen, obviously, when they switched water source to something that had a higher salinity, but it was enough to create those particular problems. Chemical reaction completely, but this is where Higher salts in, in water, higher TDS can create these, these problems. So, so we have primary health effects, and then we have these secondary effects that, that can, can affect your health, like increased uh, uh, 
uh, metals leaching into into water sources. That's not good, and and we need to to um, keep the salts down to keep that from happening. All right, so. What are our anthropogenic sources of salt? We talked a lot already about the road salt application. This is really a biggie. So um, there's you, you look at it out there and you say, okay, we're just willy-nilly spreading salt on our roads. The water melts, uh, the ice melts, it takes it, the water flows off. We have all this salt. Where is it going to go? It's going to go into the groundwater, and it's eventually going to go into surface water streams and creeks, and it's going to get to our water sources, and you're going to increase that load or, or flux, uh, as, as they call it in the paper. And so the flux is going into both the groundwater and the surface water is going to increase the natural salt load in those, those sources. So the salt levels are going to go up. Water softeners use salt to, to basically um, clean out the, uh, whether it's reverse osmosis, whether it's uh, the, the ion exchange systems, which are in most water softeners, they're using salt, uh, salt water to clean those. And, and that is the, uh, the effect that we talked about earlier. That's using salt to basically strip out the, the, the metals and any, any accumulated uh, calcium and, and things like that on the water softeners to make. So typically a water softener will run a, a, a salt flush cycle um, every, uh, every 24 hours or so. And that strips everything out. That goes down your, your, uh, your sewer and into your water system and creates the salt loads there. There. So um, agricultural practices is another huge issue. So <clears throat> fertilizer contains a lot of ammonia and other, other um, uh, chemicals that, that can d- produce salts. And once again, we're, we're talking about other types of salts besides sodium chloride, our common salt. But but what will happen is we're seeing in a lot of areas, and, and I'm probably more familiar with some of the California stuff, is that... Uh, um, uh, is that that uh, um, that we're seeing in different groundwater basins? We're increasing, we're seeing increasing salinity in those groundwater basins, specifically where there's a lot of agriculture and 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 groundwater being influenced by by excessive fertilizer use. So so that's that's going to be certainly a, be a biggie there because. You're, you're applying fertilizer, you're, you're watering, you know, especially the systems where we apply a lot of fertilizer and then we do these, uh, these big sprinkler systems, that's going to flush that, that, uh, that salt, those salts from, from the fertilizers directly into, into groundwater. It's going to percolate much, much faster. So there's a variety of industrial and commercial processes that use various salts, uh, how they dispose of, of their wastewater, uh, is one thing. Um, and that can get into groundwater surface water as well. Mining and oil production, that may create some some local issues, but generally those are going to be pretty regulated in how they dispose of their waste. So so not not as huge of an issue as as we might might expect, but uh, um, but but certainly it's there. And a, probably a surprising one for a lot of people is weathering of concrete. So concrete uses a lot of salts basically for for binders and for curing the concrete so especially when you get into uh <clears throat> into colder weather in order to accelerate the curing of concrete that's poured in in uh, lower temperatures they use salts in there that, that basically will accelerate that that curing of the concrete as that concrete weathers now those salts come out and they get flushed off by rainwater and get into our surface water and groundwater sources as well. And we all know, especially in cities, there's a lot of concrete out there. So the weathering of this concrete uh, is, is a source, not as significant as agriculture and, and road salt application, but it is a factor and probably surprises a lot of people. So, all right. So measuring salt. There's a number of different ways we measure it. Usually it's going to be indirect. So we use a, a conductivity meter is our primary method. And a conductivity me- meter will measure the ability of water, uh, electricity to flow through water. Now, clean water is not going to be a very good um, um, uh, not not allow the passage of, of electricity is not going to be a very good conductor. So 
you're going to get a lot of resistance in, in clean water. Electricity isn't going to flow through, so it's going to have very low conductivity. When you start putting things in water impurities, now you're going to create uh, more conductivity. And so your, um, so your conductivity is actually going to go up. So total dissolved solids, uh, the greater the total dissolved solids or, or salts in, in water, the higher the conductivity is going to be. So we can, measure, we can measure that indirectly. More directly, we can take a water sample, we can send it to a laboratory, and they'll actually give us a, a pretty solid number on, on uh, total dissolved solids in there. And the lab, of course, if we're interested, can break it out into, into more things, but usually uh, just a, a TDS number is, is kind of what we're looking for. Uh, there are some other methods. A hydrometer uses specific gravity to, uh, and, and compares it to the standard specific gravity of, of uh, regular water to determine how many impurities are in there. A uh, refractometer actually measures the passage of light through the water. So, so any impurities in the water, it works a lot like a turbidity meter, any impurities in the water is going to increase the refraction. So you can measure things indirectly that way. And a salinity meter is actually used more in agriculture because the salinity of, of the soils is a huge issue. High salinity soils are not going to produce uh, um, most types of crops. So, so agriculture will use salinity meter a lot. And, and generally, that's going to be more for, for soils. Uh, and, and so looking at the soil content, uh, 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 of salt uh, uh, is is going to be important for determining you know how healthy your crops are going to be. However, uh, the salinity of the soil is uh, basically your precipitation is going to pass through that, percolate to groundwater, and now you're going to increase the salinity there as it works its way down and into the water table. So, so soil salinity actually directly impacts uh, groundwater salinity as as well, and and obviously the runoff to streams and rivers is going to be uh, impacted by by the soil salinity as well. So, but salinity meter is generally used more more in agriculture. Um, in the environmental and water business, we tend to do the first two, the conductivity meter, uh, which generally is pretty accurate. We can compare the conductivity meter uh, pretty much to, to the TDS lab analyses. There's a little bit of a conversion there to get to TDS, but, but uh, most of the meters are, are pretty accurate these days. And, and so the lab will give you a certifiable result, but, but a conductivity meter is generally um, pretty much all, all you need to determine you know, what, what your TDS levels are. All right, so what are our potential solutions here? Well, number one is, uh, and uh, you know, reduce salt use. We really need to look at, uh, like, like Washington did, they reduced their salt use by using beet juice. Still some salinity there, but, but not as much. So that's actually reducing the salt component. So that's something we, we really got to look at. The willy-nilly application of, of just spreading salt on our roads uh, during, during winter to melt the ice, we got to reduce that and figure out alternative ways to, to, to deal with that. And, and uh, um, this, is, this is going to be something we're, get, we're gonna have to focus on because um, the, the, the problem is, is increasing. So we got to look at, at how to reduce the, the amount of salt that's going to groundwater and, and surface water. Improved water management. So, so this is going to be, um, you know, basically keeping the salt out of the water, not letting uh, um, the agricultural, uh, for instance, we can go to an agricultural operation, uh, operation and instead of doing, um, and this is going to benefit the agricultural operation too, instead of using center pivot irrigation systems where you're spraying water all over the place, a lot of it's being lost to evaporation, is going more to drip irrigation, really focused uh, irrigation types of things. And, and so that's one way to improve water management so that you're not creating that flushing effect and, and, and really slowing it down. Um, <clears throat> leaching with fresh water. And what I'm talking about here is, is recharge. Uh, so groundwater spreading basins uh, and, and uh, managed aquifer recharge can actually uh, uh, dilute out uh, uh, the, the, the salinity by adding more fresh water in. Uh, this is a common practice where you have saltwater intrusion around 
uh, aqu- in aquifers that are that are uh, uh, at the ocean's edge, where you're getting saltwater intrusion coming coming in, and so. Um, this can be done inland also with, with uh, where we're recharging, where we're taking, where we're being smart about it, and we're taking our spring runoff. We're putting some of that into recharge basins. Some of it we're pumping back into the aquifer, especially aquifers that are affected by increasing salinity, and then recharging those with fresher water. And you're getting back to the old solution to pollution is dilution. In that case, this this definitely works because it tends to dilute the salt, and and that's that's one method uh, to uh, we can we can use as well. And you know, getting back to the improved water management also. Um, I, I forgot to mention here is that drought um, basically increases salinity a couple ways is you're not getting as much water to dilute the so that's where the leaching with fresh water comes in is you're not getting as much precipitation coming in to dilute the salts in the soil and also we tend to over pump certain aquifers, uh, certain groundwater basins get over pumped. And because you're taking out more fresh water, what's going back in is a little saltier. Now what we're doing is we're actually increasing overall the uh, salinity in that in that groundwater basin. So so that's kind of where it, where it works. So by putting enough fresh water back in uh, and, and doing that smartly, we can we can actually prevent uh, the salt concentrations from increasing or at least slow it down. <clears throat> All right. Manage application of fertilizers. Um, gone are the days where we would just go out and throw fertilizer everywhere. And, and these days, it's a little more scientific. And in places like California, there's actually management plans for how you apply your fertilizer. Um, and, and more of that is, is coming into, into play here because um, we need to manage the amount of fertilizer that can go in and how it's applied so that it gets directly to the plants that need it but not having excess there that's going to leach to, uh, that's going to get in the soils and it's going to leach out to, to surface water and, and, uh, and get into groundwater as well. So, so this is a big deal. Um, you know, reducing the road salt and, and uh, managing application of fertilizers. Those are two huge deals that, that we really need to really need to focus on and, and there's being efforts made in that direction. We need to do more obviously, but but those are two big areas that can, that can make a really big difference. So um, uh, restoration and treatment of saline water and waste. Uh, we need to look at uh, where we how we deal with our solids uh, from our, from our wastewater treatment and and uh, things like uh, we we have um, uh, reverse osmosis systems that produce a, a brine. How do we dispose of that and and manage that a little more effectively so that's not creating in, increased uh, salinity in our in our water sources. Desalination has actually been proposed and tried on on groundwater resources. Uh, it's common, obviously, along the coast where you're where you're treating uh, 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 ocean water, saline ocean water, and treating it for drinking water purposes. But they're actually looking at it for for uh, groundwater sources that have increased uh, uh, salinity. It is an expensive solution, not real practical right now, but it has been experimented with. And so they're making some progress on that. But but probably right now, that's a little more esoteric and not a practical solution. But but it is something that, that has definitely been looking at is is groundwater pumping and, and desalinating. And, and, uh, and obviously, once you get that desalination brine, then uh, what do you do with that, too, getting back to the, the previous bullet point. And lastly, policy and regulation. I'll go back to California here. They have a, an entire study group that's looking at salts uh, and mainly focused on agriculture, but but other areas as well, and basically coming up with some policy and regulations that help manage that. Um, and for instance, looking at uh, the application of, of road salt, how we do that, how we manage that, uh, and and the uh, agricultural practices that increase to that, that result in increasing salinity in in our our groundwater basins, particularly. So, so that is uh, that is certainly an area. Um, you know, I, we. 
we sometimes need to have government solutions, government-driven solutions to, to fund the studies and, and come up with the regulations to guide things. Hopefully, we can, we can uh, come up with our own practices and solve some of these problems internally, but sometimes uh, government has to come in, and uh, uh, sometimes they get overzealous, and that, that is the problem with, with government regulations. But, but uh, this is an area where it can provide coordination regionally to, to deal with some of these issues. So having, uh, having well-thought-out policies and regulations to deal with salt management is, is definitely a, a, a pretty big deal that can, that can go towards uh, solving the, this problem. So, all right. So that is our show today. A little touching. Obviously, there's there's a lot more. There's a number of studies out there looking at this, and and it is a big problem. Probably the biggest problem you haven't heard of, but it is something that uh, that we certainly need to look at and consider. Uh, man-made activities can certainly impact the environment, <clears throat> and there are consequences to to a lot of our activities. All right. That is our show. Um, thank you. Thank you for watching. If you're interested in being a future guest on Groundwater Talk Live, we'd love to have you. If you have a good good um, um, uh, story on, on groundwater use, if you're an expert in your field, we'd love to have you on and talk about that. This is the link to come on and, and, and talk and be on a future show. We'd love to have you. All right. That is our show today. Thanks for thanks for watching. Uh, we do this every Thursday, 11 a.m. Uh, Central Time. Uh, we, we stream into LinkedIn, uh, and then we are on the Groundwater Guy YouTube channel. Please subscribe. Uh, leave your comments, likes, shares. We appreciate that. All our past shows are on there. I think we have like 120 some, some videos up there now on a variety of groundwater topics. So please stop by and check it out. And, and subscribe if, if, uh, if you like what you see. Thanks. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next week.